This sounds harsh, Chris. I should have done it four months sooner. I was paying them on credit cards and striping myself up in the process because I didn't want to make them redundant. I was always of the belief it will turn around, it will turn around. I was trying to look on the bright side. If I'd had the time again, I should have just said, I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to make it redundant four or five months before. Um, because if you can't afford something, you, you've got to be harsh to protect yourself. Um, I was lucky it worked out for us in the end, but it could have so easily gone the other way. Hi, it's Chris Watkin here, and I'm joined today by Damien Cook, who is an estate agent who's been in business since the early 90s with three branches in northeast Kent. And today we're going to talk about his estate agency journey, the ups and the downs, the trials and tribulations, so you boys and girls out there in estate agency land could learn from Damien. Damien, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Chris. Thanks for coming up from, from Kent. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about your estate agency story, the ups and downs, and uh, see if the people out there in the estate agency land could learn something from you. So when you were at secondary school, did you always want to be an estate agent? No, Chris, I wanted to be a chef, of all things. It's Why is that then? Unfortunate with my name, but I think it, it, it was something, I'd, I, I grew up watching Gary Rhodes on television. Um, okay. At the time, you had Keith Floyd and all this. It was sort of the start of celebrity chefs, and I just thought that'd be fantastic. I'd always had that as one of my hobbies, um, and so that's what I decided I wanted to do. So, as a teenager, what was your signature dish? Uh, it was a lasagna, of all things. Oh, I like a nice lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> Not a veggie one either. No. Sorry, sorry, vegetarians. Uh, and did did you just put all the meat with the one layer of white oh, sauce? Oh, lots the top? and lots of layers. Yeah, you know, it all looked very, very good. And in them days, you had to pre-cook the pasta. <laughs> <didn't you>? Yeah, <laughs> so, there's no such thing as posh fresh pasta. Goodness me. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> So, I mean, you were born in 1971, so you've got your O-levels, GCSEs, is that about, you know? Yep. And yep. Um, did you want to go to Chef College? Is there such a thing, Catering College? Yeah, well, we were very lucky in down our neck of the woods in Thanet, there was Thanet Technical College, and that's where Gary Rhodes went to learn his trade. So that sort of got me excited about it and thought, oh, you know, that could be me. If it's good enough um, for Gary, it's good, no, it's good, good enough, enough for Gary. It's good enough for Damien. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, I, I did a bit better than I thought I was going to do on my levels. Um, and then it was sort of des destiny that I had to go on to do A levels because the school sort of felt that would be the best thing to do. How did you feel about that? I think at the time I was being guided and, you know, you'd get a much better career and, oh, do you really want to be a chef? Why don't you go into hotel management? And I think being young, you're, you're sort of guided by your teachers, your parents, people like that. Okay. Um, I, so I decided that I would go to secondary school. Good, so um, in the, uh, for the sixth for form? For the sixth form. Um, probably the biggest mistake I'd ever made, to be honest. Why is that? Though? I mean, you, were go you went to the local grammar school, did you? I, I went to, to a secondary school. Okay. It was a bit rough and ready, hearts down. Very, very good school. Good teachers. Mixed school. I went from that to a more traditional grammar school, which was all boys, and it was... Was that local? Uh, that was in Ramsgate, yes, Chatham House. Okay. Um, and it was a complete culture shock on two, two fronts, really. First of all, they'd taken the Oxford exam board, and so the exams that they'd taken were a lot harder than the ones I'd taken, and they were a lot more advanced in what they'd been doing. So you sort of came in... Well, it was sort of almost like being like a lamb to the slaughter, to be honest. How did you feel about that? I think the way I felt about that at the time was it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a fantastic time in my life, I don't think. I think I'd made, I, th I kept regretting the fact that I hadn't gone to technical college to do, my, to do the cookery that I so loved. But at the same time, it, it ended up um, working out quite nicely for Why me. Why is that? Well, because at the time, most people wanted Saturday jobs um, and... Chatham House was sort of a, a, a better school than the one I'd been at. So suddenly I was offered a plethora of Saturday jobs from Waitrose through to um, where I ended up going on a Saturday, which was uh, Jesse Holness estate agents as the Saturday chap. And you would do it, you would do it because you went to the posher school, you, you yep. opened more doors with regard to the Saturday jobs? Open more do doors. I applied when I was at Hartstown. And no, 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 no. The moment I said I was at Chatham House, all the doors seemed to open. 
Okay. So it just shows you, you know, grammar schools still in Kent have their uh, have their benefits. So you worked as a as a as a basically a, in the early. So when was this? So this would have been in the uh, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Late eighties, early nineties. I'm assuming you're sticking photographs on brochures. Oh my goodness! Yeah, waiting for the photographs. That that was one of my jobs. Sticking the old photos. They'd get delivered. You know, after waiting two days, and they'd be delivered, and then you'd stick them on the type, typed up details. Um, yeah. Usually, if Donna had done the typing, who was the uh, secretary, when in the days that you had secretaries as well, she'd be typing on a typewriter, and you'd be using the tipex to correct your mistake or to do your price reduction. I tell you what, boys and girls uh, out there in the state agency land, you don't know nothing. We put, used to put photographs on our arms when the valley. We used to put five, six photographs. Oh, yeah. Cursing, saying, and then you had to when you change the price, you got the tipex out. Girl, those are the days. Those were the they? days. Okay, so. Uh, but didn't you have a, a little bit of a sideline at this point also as, as an entrepreneur? Well, that was my first foray into the sort of owning my own business. As part of uh, at Chatham House, one of the things that you had to do if you wanted to was open your own business venture. And it was sponsored by Nat West at the time. And I decided it would be a good idea to put um, video machines, which were all the rage at the time. There weren't things like PlayStations, but the arcades yeah. were the key. And pool tables and Coke machines into the common rooms at uh, Chatham House. And the headmaster agreed and signed a two-year contract with me. And I think I was paying them £12 a week. Um, and the machines were bringing in about £400 a week per common room. So I made and how many nice common profit. rooms? There were uh, four. So that's £1,500. That's £1,500. Yes. Pure profit in yes. the in the late eighties, which yes. in today's money is probably three thousand pounds yes. a month, and it, and it certainly helped me to open my estate agency when I decided to go into business. Because I, I mean, did you go and spend money. that? Did you go and spend that on fast cars? Or no, fast women? no, I was too young for that. And, and, and the rest you and, and rest you the rest <laughs> you wasted. Okay, a Vauxhall Chevy. I had a Vauxhall oh, Chevette in pale pink with a love a those. pale yellow. Sorry, with a grey ring. Google, Google it. Google Vauxhall <laughs> Chevette, uh, C H E V E double T E. Oh, it you can, you, you best discuss. car I've ever owned. Oh, <laughs> Where did you get that entrepreneurial spring from? Was that was that from your parents or your grandparents? No, interestingly, it was from my next door neighbour. Right, go on. Um, he, uh, a guy called Mike Basto, um, we're still best friends today. Very rare that we, because we became partners in which we're discussing a bit, I'm sure. But I used to look over the fence and he used to have the cars and he used to have... How old is he compared to you? Uh, Mike's 20 years older than me. Okay. So, you know, I was when I was 20, he was sort of 40. At the time, I think he went through the, the Rotary Club and then he went into... He was very into that and then the beater. And, and I remember going to the do where he, he became, you know, went from Rotary into... Uh, ro round table into beta and things yeah. like that so i remember it well and we became friendly and, and you know i used to say oh how do you do that he used to leave very early in the morning come home very late at night but he was uh, the best guy at doing barbecues south african that's where he came from yeah and he did the best barbecues and huge still to this day like huge you. yeah fantastic yeah and he, he loved his barbies but and, and you get talking and he told me what he did and he worked in London and it was so glamorous compared to um, anything else I've experienced that I thought that's something I'd like to do. So I think that's what drove me, to be honest. What did your parents give you? Um, they gave me a, a, a very nice, secure home life when okay. I was growing up. Um, they were, my mother was a school teacher and my father worked for the local council. So they were just normal people. Um, but but loving parents and and you know I had a nice childhood so it was all but I I did want more because I've always sort of had that sort of wanting to have to try and achieve the things that you want to achieve. So did you finish your A levels or did were you tempted to the dark side and go? I was tempted time? to the dark side, unfortunately, Chris. I realised much after a year of trying my absolute best that it wasn't going to be for me. Um, uh, I think because I'm assuming Chatham House are trying to get everyone into Oxbridge. They were getting everyone into Oxbridge, and I was nowhere near. In fact, I always remember there was a, a, a really fantastic chemistry teacher, a guy called Bernie Farrell. Absolutely wonderful guy. He had a butterfly collection, and if you wanted to spend the lesson talking about butterflies and not chemistry, you just mention his butterfly collection, he'd be off. But I remember he said at a parents' evening to my parents, Damien will never ever be a chemist, and he won't get his A level. Um, but he's probably going to end up earning more money than I ever will. 
And I always remember that because it was sort of that double-handed compliment because mm -hmm. uh, my parents were like, you're not trying hard enough in chemistry. Um, but at the same time, I think he realised that that's the, you know, I had that sort of... When you, when you left way sixth with... form at Chatham House, did you get any hassle from your parents? They weren't happy. Um, they, uh, my mother, my, my, my mum and dad's dreams, I think, were me off to university and everything else, and it was going to be fantastic. Um, uh, it was do my... you have any brothers or sisters? <clears throat> I've got one sister. She's a, a surgeon now. Okay. And so they very quickly realised that they were spending their time with the wrong wrong sibling okay. and they then spent the time then pushing her through university which she did very well and is now a surgeon so excellent excellent you must be very proud of her yeah i am yeah okay so you went to become a full-time neg where rats was that and that was at jesse holness um, okay. under a mentor a guy called ron foster um he was very well known down in in thanet um it was him and his business partner, a chap called Adrian Marks, and Jesse Holness started in 1838. I remember it well, because he always used to say, make sure you tell everyone when we first established. They were one of the first estate agents in Thanet. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time there, um, and I learned an awful yeah. lot. Did you still have your contract at the school, even though you left halfway through? No, when I left, the, the, on the day that I left, because I had a bit of a falling, not a falling out, but a disagreement with the headmaster who, I think a lot of the parents started complaining that little Tommy was spending all their lunch money on the on my machine. So he wanted to take them out. And that was the first time I got to say, well, we've got a contract. What compensation am I going to get? Okay. I think the headmaster was a little bit cross, but because it was sponsored by Nat West, he really couldn't do a lot about it. Okay. Um, and on the day I left Chatham House was the day that all the machines came out of all the common rooms. Did you manage to get, I don't want to know the figures, but did you manage to get some form of compensation? I didn't need to, because I'd left. I was, it was the, after, the, after the time, and, and I, I just thought, it's just not worth it. I need a reference from school. I didn't, you know, I kept them as long as I could, and they wanted them out after probably month two, I think. <laughs> all the kids are spending the money on the exactly. side and, and, and things. <laughs> okay, but let us learn. You didn't spend the money, you saved that away. I saved that away, yeah. Excellent. But again, that's quite rare for a youngster to, to save the money, isn't it? Well, I was lucky I was living at home. I think that was the key. And, uh, that, you know, I've got mum and dad to thank for that. I was quite, you know, I didn't have a huge amount. I paid rent. And, and as I think w when you're growing up, if your parents, you know, you're staying there, your mum's doing all your washing and you're sort of 18, you, 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 you should really be doing that. Um, and I think that helped me because that helped me save. So that was good. Excellent, excellent. So um, how long were you at uh, Jesse Holness's for? I think probably on and off for probably two and a half, three years. What do you mean on and off? Do you well, because about? What, what, what happened, I, I was working hard for Jesse Holness, but I wasn't earning a huge amount of money. I think the most I took home was £90 in a week. So that's, uh, you know, not a huge amount even then, but... There were the promises of bigger things to come, but the progression didn't happen quite as classic, quickly as I would have liked. Classic. So is that the time where you went, uh, is it, did Mike Besto, your friend, your, ne uh, your South African guy that lived next door, is that yeah. the one where he offered you a job then? Yeah, he saw how hard I was working um, and what I was doing, and he said, why don't you come and work in London? Which was a big thing to think about. In hindsight, if I'd thought about it, what Mike wanted was a driver. Yeah, <laughs> he wanted me to be doing the driving rather than him. Um, but at the time, I sort of, with, with uh, you know, the way you are, you, you sort of think, wow, yeah, London, that would be fantastic. I want to do that. Um, it was a, it was a, a very, very quick and hard lesson because the job was commission only. Um, and when you're driving up to London at five in the morning and you're getting home at nine at night every day, it gets quite tiring. Um, but thoroughly enjoyed it and certainly opened my eyes to a different way of living. I mean, some of the salesmen at this place were just incredible. Was Mike a salesman as well? Or? He was a sales manager, so he ran the, the whole of the team um, for the vending division. So it was selling coffee machines on seven-year contracts to anyone who would buy them. So you had to drive him there and then your job was to sell the stuff and yes. then drive him back? Yeah, yeah. But the lesson learned was is that you put hard work and you get the rewards. You get the rewards. Some of it's luck. Um, I drove into a petrol station once and sold the chap um, in the petrol station a drinks machine on the back of all these people who have a coffee when they come in to, to buy their petrol. So it was very early days, but he was sold a seven, seven year contract at 3,000 drinks a month. And I think, unfortunately, he had big boxes of these drinks arriving because you got them every month regardless if you'd signed the contract. 
So I felt a little bit guilty because he showed me the stock room. What am I going to do with all of these drinks? Hopefully he did sell them. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever go back? Oh, I, I, unfortunately the garage burnt down now. I don't think it was anything to do with the drinks, but... It, it certainly was a, you know, it was a lucrative way of selling things, but it was quite hard sell and closing. I think that was the, uh, what I learned from that, that Okay, experience. but very soon you and Mike decided to set up your own estate agents. Yeah. Did Mike come in with you, or was it just financial, or did he come in and work for you? It was really, it was really interesting because... Because you couldn't have been that old at that point. You could have been early 20s. Early 20s, 20. I think I start, we started looking at the idea sort of 19 and a half. Hold on, you've half. been a negotiator for no more than a couple of years, yep. tops. Yep. Never run your own branch. No. Nope. And you decided, oh, what the hell, we're going to start my own estate agents. That's what we were experienced in. Um, that's what my experience was in. But Mike was obviously a fantastic salesman. So he, uh, uh, and sort of a, a safe pair of hands. Mike had a few businesses on top of his sales manager's job. He owned an old people's home with his brother. So he he had quite a lot of experience and really had an accountant. And I think it was, he just fancied, we got on so well, because I was with him most of the time, driving in turn from London as well. It's a long time to be chatting in the car. Yep. Um, I never smoked, he did. And he, he, he actually apologised because he used to smoke in the car with all the windows done up. That was, that was it was those days. Um, but I think, so it was, it was a big gamble, but one of the things that he said to me, um, was that we had to go in 50-50. If we're going to do it, I'm not going to own it and you work for me. We'll be equal partners. And we were for 25 years without an argument, which is quite incredible, really. Um, I'm quite proud of that, actually. But did he actually, was he there on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, every day. Doing what? Well, interestingly, his wife was our secretary. So she came in every day, which was always fun if they'd had a row at home. Um, that was always quite a, uh, okay. an interesting experience. There was myself and Mike, and that's how we started, the three of us. So he was almost like your work dad? Yeah. That's the way I look at him. Still do, actually. Fantastic. Yeah. That's brilliant. So you, you got a shop, you opened up, where were originally where? Ramsgate? Or? No, no, we, we opened in Margate, we were in Cliftonville. It was an old fireplace shop. That's the, old, that's the posh part, isn't it? it well, it, it used to be at the time. Broadstairs now is the posh part. Broadstairs, isn't it? but now it, it's coming back again. But at the, you know, when we opened, it was sort of uh, housing benefit central with lots of old guest houses turned into sort of homes of multiple occupation. So it was a bit sort of dodgier. Um, there were still the remnants of some of the nicer shops there. Um, but it's, um, we opened up in an old fireplace shop, which we bought freehold um, for an absolute, you know, at the time, a fantastic price. And then we did it all up ourselves. We painted it, decorated it, did the whole thing ourselves. So how were the first, you know, early 90s, the market was, was hard work, but if you put hard work in, you get the, the benefit from it. Um, Go through to the 90s, you've, then you had the two, early 2000s when things were really kicking off in the marketplace and any estate agent could make money. When did you open your second and third branches? Well, what was interesting for us, we had some stroke, we had a bit of a stroke of luck in a particular chap came into our office at the time. Not a lot was selling in 92, 93. It was hard, as you said, you'd, if you got something on, um, you, if you really worked hard, you could sell it. But a chap came in and he was our, we, at the time we didn't do lettings when we very first opened because I'd never done lettings. You know how to sell things, but you know, I'd done a national association course to quickly make sure we were doing things correctly. Chap came in one day, scruffy chap, um, wearing a pair of sandals, turned up in a rusty old golf car, remember him well, pulled up on the forecourt. And he uh, ended up buying nearly 80 properties for us. In the, the early course, 90s? In the early 90s, over the course of six months, flats um, for £10,000 each to rent them out. Um, he said to me, if I buy, you know, what happened, we, the reason he, he stayed with us is we spent some time with him, whereas a lot of other people just ignored him, but we took him out, showed him the area. I was keen as mustard, I still am. But, you know, took him out, spent a bit of time with him, and he said, right, could you look after them for me? So of course you, you said yes. And of course I said yes, and then quickly came back and looked up the, quickly became an ARLA member as quickly as I could to do the training courses. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was quite lucky in that Mike's wife, Sharon, who was our secretary at the time, used to manage an HMO for her sister, I think it was. So she had some experience in what to do. 
So we did it all properly from day one, opened a client account, did it as Arla had told us to, and it stood us in good stead. We're still members now. I think it's very important. So if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for that chap, you wouldn't have set up your lettings agency, which when you got to 2007, when the credit crunch hit, yeah. you were hit hard, weren't you? 2007 wasn't our finest hour. It was the hardest time that I, it was the first proper recession I ever went through. Um, when I say it wasn't our finest hour, I think the, the, the worst thing I remember is, firstly, I was booked to go on a holiday which I cancelled because I didn't think it was right that I, I'm going on some sunny holiday when I'm then having to make staff redundant. It's the only time I've had to do it. Um, made two members of staff redundant. I felt absolutely awful. It was like almost sort of upsetting family. It, it, it was the how worst many, thing I've ever done. So how many staff did you have when, when you... When... Uh, at the time we had our lettings team, which remained, but we had uh, three staff a branch and we had to bring it down to two staff a branch because otherwise we wouldn't have survived. And it was hard. Can you remember the time when, the night before, you had to make someone redundant, how you felt? I felt absolutely awful. Um, I remember sort of almost begging Mike to do it, but Mike, being my work dad, said, no, that's your job to do that. You need to get the experience of the, all the good times and the bad times as well. Um, and so, therefore, I had to go you'd in been and... you'd been married now, I think you were married around the millennium, were you? Is that about right? I'd, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we got you know, and uh, and you had a, uh, you had your daughter almost a year afterwards, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a very very worrying time because on top of the fact that your business is struggling, you you can't borrow money because your house has gone down in value. You really are up against the wall, um, and so we cut back and cut back and cut everything that we could, and even then we found that you know. Even after all those cuts, we still needed to make people what redundant. What support did your wife give you? She was absolutely wonderful. I, I think she realised how upset I was. Um, because it was, to me, it was almost, it was, it was like a domino effect. I think, you know, one thing would happen, something it would get worse and it would get worse. And you do think to yourself, where's it going to stop? And she was very supportive and I, I was very lucky. She had a good job. She was PAYE, um, and she was very supportive. And she said, look, don't worry, you can start again if it all really does go badly wrong and you have to, you know, in the worst case scenario, you'd have to close the business. We'll still survive. We'll still be able to pay the mortgage. We were fortunate in that respect. But I'd sunk everything in to Cook & Co at that stage. So we'd reinvested, we'd gone for new offices, we'd, you know, we had three branches. We'd, we, we wanted to have a, a really good business in Thanet. And so making those two people redundant was probably the worst day of my life. The best day was re-employing them about a year, a year later. Had they got jobs in the meantime? Or? Yes, they'd got jobs in the meantime. Um, completely different, not, nothing to do with estate agency. But when things picked up again, um, I went and offered them a good package and fortunately they came back to me. Can I come back to the time you made them redundant? Mm. Is there anything you'd do differently and what advice would you give to any estate agents who might have to do that in the future? I think the only advice I could... The, this sounds harsh, Chris. I should have done it four months sooner. I was paying them on credit cards and striping myself up in the process because I didn't want to make them redundant. I was always with the belief it will turn around, it will turn around. I was trying to look on the bright side. If I'd had the time again, I should have just said, I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to make it redundant four or five months before. Um, because if you can't afford something, you, you've got to be harsh to protect yourself. Um, I was lucky it worked out for us in the end, but it could have so easily gone the other way. So 2008, 2009, you, make, you, you re-employed these guys What's been the last 12, 13 years for you? Like, been like, I, I mean, I, I've been, you know, after all of, after all of that, it's, it's been an upward spiral, really. It's been fantastic. I mean, did, you, did the lessons you learnt from the credit crunch help you when you went into COVID? I think there, there's two things that happened with the, with, with the, um, with the recession. It made me realise I wasn't organised enough. And... I was very, very lucky at the time. I banked with Barclays um, and I had a fantastic bank manager 
Um, what, a real life one? A real life bank manager, somebody who'd come into the office, someone I could talk to on the phone every day if I needed to. And he was, uh, again, probably one of the reasons that I was so lucky to keep my business because so many other people had had bank managers who just foreclosed on them. I know of several estate agents that that happened to, where the bank just pulled the plug. Whereas Nick, at the time, he was a senior bank manager. Uh, I was very lucky. He said to me, you need to get more organised. You need to know exactly. You need to be able to do lots of projections. He knew a guy, which it seems completely left field, but he said to me, you want to employ this bookkeeper who's an ex Barclays corporate manager. He will be able to provide you with all the things I need um, and he'll be able to do things like your VAT, so that will take you away from that side of the business so you can concentrate on what you're good at, which is selling houses and not being drowned you, in paperwork. Do you think as an estate agent, a lot of agents are get guilty of, of, of being sucked into those sort of £10 an hour jobs? I think a agents are renowned for it. You know, we're social media experts, we're accountants, we're, you know, we're the cleaner when we need to be. Um, and I think what you've got to do is manage your time to do what you're good at. And usually that's dealing people to people. And because you're the business owner, you're the, you're, the buck stops with you. So I think that's what, as you say, a lot of agents do. They go off to do as many jobs as they can and fill their time incorrectly. So coming back to how the uh, recession of 2007, eight helped you with COVID, you, you were more organized. So that, how did that check make the difference in terms of your business when lockdown one hit? I think when lockdown one hit, I was more worried about my staff's health than I was about the business. It sounds really strange. We had, you know, we had, I knew in my own mind that we had the reserves behind us at that time to survive and that I could pay the staff and make sure they're okay. And, and one has to remember, we closed a week before the Prime Minister announced that it was closed because I could see the writing was on the wall with, with COVID. And I was watching it and I thought, no, you can't have these staff mixing in a small confined office. So I closed the offices and I said to the staff, look, we can survive a while. I reassured them all and I said, look, it might be over in weeks. I think a lot of people said that. I do. I it remember. might take a little bit of time, but something I'll have to give. Um, and so I closed the offices. Um, I was worried. I remember having, again, that, that same sort of sinking feeling and, and, and saying to my wife, God, I don't know where, where we're going to be in six months' time. But having the good team members that I've got, they're all quite understanding. And I think I was ready because I had everything. I was quite lucky. I'd invested in VoIP phone system. So we could all work from home mm. and, or we could all still communicate. And we'd invested in a system that allowed us to work remotely. And we didn't do it for that reason. It was so that we could share information between offices. And suddenly we've got a working from home yep. model and it was already there. So we were, we were one of the... I Did think you have to furlough ones. anyone? Um, we furloughed in the first lockdown, didn't in the second lockdown at all. But in the first lockdown, when it initially came, came in, we, everybody went on furlough because you didn't know what you were doing. Very soon after that, we, we could start re-employing. The, the poor people who didn't go on furlough were our lettings team. Um, they worked all the way through um, and they never were furloughed, any of them. So it's quite incredible, really. Bless them. So now you're running a successful three branch operation. What do you love about a state agency now in 2022? I like my team. I like the fact that I've got people who have been working for me, most of which now over 10 years. Um, people that I can trust, people who are still dedicated and are enjoying the job. Okay. And because of that, we tend to deal with nice people. It sounds really strange, but it's sort of a magnet for <coughs> the nicer people. And we don't tend to deal with anyone who's particularly horrible. And do you have any regrets? From the, from the last 25 years? 30 regrets. years, actually. 30 years, actually. 30 years. In the last 30 years, have I got any regrets? I Would think... you, or let me ask a different way. Would you do anything differently? I you, think, yes. Because you, yeah. you must have bought out Mike. I think the one thing that I... Re the, the, the one thing I would certainly do differently, and, and, and I think this is really good advice for anyone in their own business or anyone who's under any sort of pressure... Look after yourself. Look after your own health. Because you've recently lost 11 stone. Yes. 
which is a huge amount of weight to lose. What was the catalyst behind that? I listened to the Prime Minister saying that obese people uh, are very much at risk of dying. And it certainly made, suddenly made me realise, hang on, I'm one of those. Um, I'd been to the doctors um, pre-COVID um, for a medical checkup, as they like the NHS like to do. And I remember the doctor's words to me were, my cholesterol was something like one, which was fantastic. I didn't have any blood sugar problems, which was fantastic. And he said, this is amazing for a fat bloke. That was his words to me. And that was the first thing that kicked in. And then when, once COVID hit, and I was enjoying the, the brown ale from Gad's Brewery, um, who delivered kegs of ale to my house, which was lovely. Um, at, they've got a little brewery down in Ramsgate. Um, it was madness because three o'clock in the afternoon, you'd be, you know, enjoying a nice cold beer. Um, big mistake because it piled on weight and I wasn't looking after myself. And I think it was two things. It was stress and also it's quite a sedentary job anyway, working behind yeah. a desk. So I think that's what I would do differently. Certainly look after myself a little bit more. And also if you've got young children, make sure you spend the time. Um, and that's something I think, you know, I worked hard to do. I was quite lucky. My daughter wanted to be a ballerina when she was younger. And she went up to, to um, we were fortunate enough to, give, to let her try her dream. And I used to spend every Thursday um, with her. So I used to take her up to London to the Royal Ballet for her to have lessons and everything else. And, and uh, with a lovely lady called Maina Gilgood, super, uh, John Gilgood's niece. Um, and she was a, a choreographer and she used to teach Becky. Um, so I was lucky in that I got that family time with my daughter. But I think a lot of people I hear, oh, I'm working till late, and their family almost takes a second place. Uh, have she, has she gone into the business? Becky's really sensible, actually. No. Um, she said that's the last thing she wanted to do. Um, and now she's uh, working for a record label in London, striking her own path, doing something completely different, doing social media and, and enjoying herself. And talking about enjoying yourself, apart from obviously your work and uh, your wife and your daughter, what hobbies and passions have you got in your life? Me, I'm, I'm quite simple, Chris, really. I, 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 like, uh, I like gardening um, and I like pets. I've got lots of dogs and lots of chickens as well, which is okay. nice. So we have lots of fresh eggs, which is great. Um, it's, a, it's amazing how they eat everything, isn't it? Oh my God, they're they're incredible. My 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 girls, I've got four of them, and they're fantastic. They're all like buff Orpington, so they're quite large. They're unusual chickens, let's, let's say that. But they're, they're they're they take some looking after, but they're fun. And my dogs play with them. They're in the in the garden. I've got bull terriers, and a and a chihuahua who's in charge. Um, but they they well, you can let them all out. They all let, they all play together. Yeah, they don't. The dogs don't attack the chickens or anything like that. It's all about how the dogs are introduced to them and how they're trained. But they, they just walk around as if they're not there. In fact, the chickens are more in charge. If the dogs have their food in the garden, the chickens will come and eat it and scare the, scare the dogs off. They're meant to be ferocious bull terriers. They have, I don't think they are. <laughs> um, and your wife, Louise, what does she bring to the party in terms of making you a better human being? I think my wife brings love to the, to the whole situation. She's also... Um, she doesn't suffer fools, my, my wife, which I think is sometimes... Um, you know, I think sometimes quite a good thing because I'm the eternal optimist. Being a salesman and a business owner, you're the eternal optimist. And there's always light at the end of the tunnel and there's always a good thing around the corner. My, my wife's a little bit more sensible and she sort of says it as it is. And if she thinks something's not right, she, she would say, no, that's not right. We need to, you need to look at that. And I think that's sort of a nice balance, a bit of yin and yang. And I think you need that, you know, my wife's, when you're running a company, most people, regardless, we're quite open at Cook & Co. You can sort of say what you think, but you still get people will hang back from saying that you might be making a mistake. Of course, because you're their boss. My wife will tell me straight up front, and she's, oh, she's my boss, let's be honest. Exactly. I like to think I'm in charge, but truthfully, she's in charge. You have the, you <laughs> but have don't put that on video, because I'll get into trouble. You have the last word, yes, dear. <laughs> Okay, so you're 50 years old. Yes, um, for my sins. What does the next 20 years look like for Damien? I think from my point of view, um, I want to still carry on enjoying 
estate agency exactly as I do it, as always I have done. I think it's once it's in your blood, it's very hard to get away from it. And I still enjoy going out. I still enjoy, enjoy doing viewings. I still enjoy doing valuations. I still enjoy meeting the public. From my point of view though, I think it's a case the next 10 years to start with, uh, making sure that I've got great team in place and I keep the people who are with me happy. Um, and also train some new people and hopefully have some new estate agents on the horizon that I can mentor and look after. And I think that's, that's where I'm looking. I'm not looking at any time that, you know, you get, as when you're a business owner and you've been doing it for 30 years, every five minutes there's an email saying, we've got somebody who wants to buy your business. I think I know how vendors feel now. <laughs> when they get the letter from the estate agent through the door, we've got a client for your house. I'm not looking to, to put up the range yet. I feel too young to do that. I, I, I just want to enjoy it. What would your advice be to anyone in their 20s? or even 30s, thinking of starting their own estate agency in the future? Someone asked me this, Chris, um, about three or four weeks ago. Would I start an estate agency now? The problem I've got is I probably wouldn't. I think the cost now of trying to compete in an overcrowded marketplace is quite high. I think... I think there's certainly a place for self-employed estate agents if they're doing um, some sort of bespoke work and, and they find a niche market for themselves where they can really offer some fantastic customer service. I think there's certainly always that. Would I want to open a branch and go that route with the portal costs and the advertising costs and the staff costs and all the new laws and legislations and data protection and money laundering and everything else to boot? I probably would say think very carefully, unless you've got very, very deep pockets. Um, it's great while the money's coming in, but remember there's always times that the money isn't coming in and you've still got to pay the staff. And and the because the staff, however lovely they are, if they don't get paid at the end of the month, they won't hang around for long. <laughs> Damien, thank you for your time today. And it's I hope you boys and girls out there in the state agency land have learnt something from that. Thank you for your time. Lovely. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.